You know, I've been feeling churchy this morning. Y'all know what that means, feel churchy? Feeling churchy is like, you know, that old school church uh, that I talk about often. I like old school church. I was listening to a, I was listening to a gospel quartet when I was coming to church this morning that John P. Key has on one of his, on one of his albums. Y'all don't know nothing about no John P. Key. And you know, John P. Key, he go to sing, he'd be singing a song like, I want you to dance right now. You know, he don't, he don't suggest it. You know, he, he tell people, you're going to dance right now. And you know, when the churches I grew up in, you know, everybody had a tambourine. And, you, and some folks done played that tambourine until they only had one little, one little jingle left on it. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And then knock the hole up in the side of the thing and the canvas. So y'all know what I'm talking about, Jesse? But they, they play them tambourines and get to clapping and screaming and pull out a hanky and shake it at the preacher. You know, I know that church ain't popular no more, that kind of church. But that's where I was raised at, you know, where the preacher say something good and you scream back at him, preach, preacher. You know, or some, some sister would say, some mother in the church say, talk. That's all she say, talk. You know, and, and when you get to preaching real good, you, they start frying chicken in the back, right? And making peach cobbler, and all the church mothers had their little jiffies on back there already preparing the meal for at the church, because church so good, you got to fry chicken. <laughs> Listen, I don't know about it. My daddy used to say everything that was new, he never called it new. He called it newfound. And, and, it, and I remember when uh, they came out with remote control TV and my dad got that remote in his hand, Beverly, he didn't know what to do with that remote and he had all them buttons on it and he said, I don't know what to do with this newfound technology. <laughs> he was used to them TVs with them rabbit ears with the aluminum foil up on it where you had to move it around. And if you want to change the channel, you had to give a little effort to it. You had to actually get up out the recliner and walk over there and click it. And you only had three stations. And then you got that fourth one. We really thought the world was coming to an end when we got that fourth one. Ours was channel 33. When we got channel 33, we knew Jesus was coming back any minute. Four, four channels is too many to have in your house at one time. Y'all don't know nothing about that, huh? Back when we had screen doors on our houses. And the bottom, the bottom corner knocked out. And had that, that spring on it. When you open it, it slammed. Well, pow! You couldn't sneak out, sneak back in, cause your mama heard him. <laughs> your mom and them heard the door, pow! And the, that's the way I was raised, y'all. I still, got, I'm glad I got some old school still in me. You know, in other words, what I'm trying to say is, I don't know what to do with this newfound, this newfound church. I like, I like that old church. Where you, you, you got to, you know, if your elbows wasn't going, you really wasn't having church. <laughs> And if you didn't sweat in church, you ain't really been in church. <laughs> I read one of my preacher buddies the other day. He, Clint Brown, he was, last night he posted a picture after he preached in Port St. Lucie. He was sweating, he had a towel, and he said, you ain't really preaching unless you sweat it. <laughs> and back in the day, we used to say, you ain't been to church unless you sweat. In other words, you had to break a heel, <laughs> shake your doo down, somebody earring fly off, bobby pin popping out. You didn't even know they had bobby pins up in there. This generation don't know what bobby pins are. Y'all know nothing about them clothes hanger pins either, do you? Them little wooden ones? That's the one you used on your bicycle when you put the card in the spokes. Brrr. Renee, you know what I'm talking about? There's some old timers up in here. Now listen, back in the day when I started preaching, you know, I'd go to, to these little churches all through Louisiana and they was all white frame, white A-frame churches, you know, with tin roofs. Y'all know what I'm talking about? And had pews in them and wooden floors and they was on pier and beam. That means they wasn't on the ground. They were lifted up off the ground so that when you stomp, it went all over the earth. <laughs> You'd be scaring stuff in the bushes. And then you could, the dust would start floating up all over the same. You'd look all over the building and just dust just floating around in the building. Y'all don't know nothing about that kind of church, do you? And there wasn't nothing but the drummer, I told y'all this not long ago, he ain't had nothing, and it was usually her. But they, she had nothing but a kick drum and a snare. That's it, right? And they, they would hit on that 2 4, boy, just boom, pat, 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 pat. Never mind. 
Anyway, tell your neighbor, I wish somebody's soul would catch on fire. Remember them old songs like, can't nobody do me like Jesus? Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Y'all remember those songs? I used to love all them songs, man. And then, and then I went to a white church and they were singing, I'm a tree, I'm a tree, I'm a green olive tree. I knew I'm in the wrong church. <laughs> well, y'all know me and I know you. So y'all know when I come in here, I'm gonna preach loud and run all over the place. And you know what I'm talking about? So I'm gonna ask you to stand for the reading of God's word and open your Bibles to Psalm 142. And we're gonna, we're gonna see what, uh, I feel comfortable today. I wore my tennis shoes just in case I wanted to run on and see what the end gonna be. That's what another thing the old saints used to say, run on, see what the end going to be. <laughs> Amen. Lord, help us to smell fried chicken <laughs> on today. Psalm 142. Psalm 142. We're going to read seven scriptures, and then I'm going to preach a little bit. Don't change nothing now. Sound like y'all changing something. Y'all start changing stuff now. Amen. That's another thing the old folks used to say. Leave well enough alone. If it ain't broke, y'all preaching to me. Psalm 142. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. Underline these words, I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knew my path in the way wherein I walked, they have privately laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me. No man cared. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto you, O Lord. I said, you are my refuge. You are my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry. Listen to these words. For I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors. For they are stronger than I. Verse 7. Bring my soul out. Bring my soul out of prison that I may praise your name. In other words, Lord, if you'll get me out of this, I'll give you a praise like I've never given you. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. We're going to take our text this morning from verse number 2 and verse number 7. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble bring my soul out of prison that i may praise your name i showed before him my trouble i'm gonna preach a message this morning entitled trouble i'm gonna tell god on you come on look at somebody next to you and say those words trouble now look back at them and tell them i'm not calling you trouble i'm just telling you we talking to trouble Father, we thank you for the reading of your words, and I pray, God, that you will just have your way in the hearts of all of your people, and that the anointing will just permeate this atmosphere. And I pray, God, that you give me an apostolic anointing to be able to properly enunciate and announce the declarations of heaven over all of our destinies today. We break every generational curse and bind every generational spirit. And we give you praise for an open heaven over this sanctuary. We give you a praise, praise right now for people that have been set free. Where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. And we thank you for the freedom to praise you today. Thank you for delivering us out of darkness and the power of sin. Thank you, Lord, for saving us from a hellish life. We give you praise, Lord, for a prosperous, wealthy, healthy life. You have come to give us life and life more abundantly. And we praise you for abundant life this day in Jesus' name. Put your Bibles down. Put your hands together. One more time, shout to God. Give him praise, everybody.
You may be seated. Thank you for being in the house of the Lord today. When you read Psalm 42, you're reading the writing of a man that is not becoming a king. He is a king. King David. King David is very powerful in Scripture, and his life is laid out so genuinely before us that it's almost like an open letter. There's just not much hid in the life of David. He was a man of celebration. He loved music. He was a man of romance. He loved love. He was a man of war. He loved shedding blood. David was a man that was complex as an individual. And his life was compounded with victory after victory after victory. To the point the Bible would declare of King David, that God gave him victory everywhere he went. To the point that God told him, you will no longer see your enemies. He didn't tell him you wouldn't have enemies. He just said, you'll be so focused that you won't even notice that your enemies are there. But even with men that carry that kind of fortitude, there is still this idea, there's still this suggestion, there's still this reality that we all have to deal with adversity. Because you are anointed, that, that does not make you exempt from trouble in life. At one point, he's going to just bow down his own head and say, I am anointed, but I'm weak. One version reads it like this, I'm weak, but I'm still anointed. Yes. See, none of us have the wonderful privilege of going through life and not experiencing seasons of weakness. The formative processing of God concerning your purpose in the earth does not ask for your permission. And I've always said when you bypass the process, you become a byproduct. So the question is, do you want to be the real deal? Or do you want to carry some superficial facade for people to look at, look at, but behind the facade there's no reality, there's no authenticity. Nothing is real, there's no content to the character. So when David writes Psalm 142, he says, I showed before him my trouble insinuating the idea that I know where to take trouble to. <laughs> Powerful thought that Hezekiah followed that example. When Sennacherib threatened him with letters, the Bible says he took the letters of threat from Sennacherib to the house of God and laid them out on the altar. In other words, saying to God, God, do you see what the enemy is saying? <laughs> it's very important for us to realize that the most important entity in your life is not your friends. It's not even your family. But it's the God you serve. You got to be careful about who you share your trouble with. Because you share your trouble with the wrong people, they'll start questioning why you're going through that trouble. As if you've done something to deserve the trouble you're going through. So you can't just talk to everybody about your trouble. You got to know that when you talk to God about your trouble, God don't share your trouble with nobody else. Right. Trouble in Hebrew is affliction. We talked about that this morning. All affliction comes with attributes. And if you want to know what they are, then get the service from this morning. The word trouble it's interesting because Daniel Webster defines it as turbulence. Turbulence. You've heard me talk about that. Turbulence is agitation in the atmosphere. It has to do with being agitated mentally, spiritually. It's to be worried or disturbed inwardly. This is an interesting definition that I found. Turbulence or trouble is to put into confused motion, causing ultimately a great inconvenience. Now listen to the definition. To put into confused motion, 
In other words, when trouble shows up in your life, it doesn't stop you from moving. It just causes you to move ambiguously instead of accurately. Trouble shows up to disturb your direction. A lot of people have motion and movement in their life, but when you are moving in a confused state, you're moving not knowing really where you're going because motion and movement does not denote progress. Don't fool yourself into thinking because you're moving, you're going somewhere. I can tell you about a people called the Israelites that were moving and stayed in the same place for 40 years. Talk back to me. I just need you to say amen to me. So when he said, I laid my trouble before God, he said, I took the thing that was causing me to be confused and I laid it before him. Trouble comes in all shapes and sizes. Are y'all with me? Trouble, turbulence, commotion, atmospheric agitation. Turbulence, to move up and down violently or aggressively. Have you ever felt like you was going through life and life was up one day, down the next day? You don't even get to spend a week up. You just want three days of happiness. Just give me two days of peace. But life can just get real erratic and up, down. Sunday, you're up, but Monday's on the way. We used to preach Friday's here, but Sunday's on the way. Now we say Sunday's here, but watch out. But Monday's on the way. But you have to be careful of developing a pattern in your life of accepting ups and downs. If you do that, it become, you become accustomed to the turbulence. It's almost like you build an expectation that this is how life is supposed to be. Are y'all in the building? Up, down, up, down, up, down, up, down. And you would think if you're anointed an apostle, surely you would hit level times. You would go through planes of peace, right? Can I introduce to you the most prolific apostle in all of the New Testament? His name is the Apostle Paul. He writes to the church in Corinth in his second epistle. In chapter number one, verse number eight, he says, For we would not, brothers, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had this sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves but in God which raises the dead, who delivered us from so great a death and does deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. So he says, we would not, brothers, have you ignorant of our trouble. It's powerful when you are man enough or woman enough to admit it. You are a powerful entity when you are strong enough to say, not, I don't have any trouble. But when you're strong enough to say, I'm in trouble right now. Am I right about it? And he writes an entire church and says, I don't want you to be ignorant of our trouble. What is he saying? Very powerful. In other words, he could be communicating this, Pastor D. I know how to handle my trouble. But I'm not sure you know how to handle my trouble. So when he says, I would not have you to be ignorant of my trouble, what he is saying is, let me clear some things up. Read it in the Greek. 
The etymology is on this wise. I don't want you to be misinformed about my trouble. Because how many of you know that people can miscommunicate what you're going through? So people can see you going through something and start talking about it to somebody else and totally misinterpret what you just told them that is going on in your life till it's blown out of proportion and it's become something that it's really not. That's called misinformation. So he said, I don't want you to be misinformed, but at the same time, I don't want you to be uninformed. In other words, I want you to know that as a man of God, I go through trouble too. I don't want you to be misinformed. I don't want you to be uninformed. And more than anything, the root word of ignorant is ignore. I don't want you to ignore my trouble. Thank God for people that we can call on and say, hey, I'm going through H-E double toothpick right now. And I ain't going to tell everybody, but I'm going to let you know because I don't want you to be ignorant about what I'm going. Don't ignore me. Isn't this something that everybody wants you in their life when you on top? But when you go through a little trouble, then people start, I don't know if I really want you in my life no more. Are y'all in the building? So he says, do not ignore what I've been going through. And that's why David said, I looked for somebody that cared. No man cared for my soul. Everybody say admit it. Admit it. There's nothing wrong with admitting I'm going through a season of T-R-O-U-B-L-E. Going through a season of trouble. Now, for those of you who are sleeping, I'm going to help you sleep. I'm going to talk real soft like this so you, you, you can get you some good rest. The best place to sleep is in church. Right? Here's the problem. There are churches in this city you can actually go and sit in and sleep. Then get a good hour and a half. Well, most churches don't go an hour and a half no more. They go an hour and two minutes because they don't want to offend nobody going too long, taking too much of your time. You know, and then they keep everything real soft so you can get your good hour and two minutes of rest. And then you get to go home and, you know, do whatever you're going to do on Sunday afternoon, Sunday fun day. But here's, this is me though, here's the difference in me. When I see people going to sleep in my church, I say, wake up in Jesus' name. See, I just don't, don't, you know, don't go sleep in the club, baby. Don't come over here and sleep in my, in my church. Amen. You wasn't sleeping in that club last night. I'm trying to help you. Hold on a minute. Preach, Bishop. I done told y'all, if y'all don't help me preach, I will help myself. So he says, I'm in trouble. And he says in verse 8, this trouble pressed me out of measure. It weighed me down to the point of it being a burden. It's one thing when trouble shows up and then leaves, but it's another thing when trouble moves in and just weighs down on you till now you're a nuisance. Now you are a burden. Now I've prayed and you haven't left. I fasted and you still at my dining room table. Y'all ain't never experienced no kind of trouble like that? I sought God, but every time I turn around, trouble is right there. And if you're not careful with trouble, trouble will press you out of measure. 
Are y'all in the building? It's from the base word. Listen to this. Troubles from a base word. It means profound. It means a mystery. It means a secret. In other words, it's so profound that it's taking you out of who you normally are. When he says it's pressed me out of measure, it means this trouble is not like the trouble I've experienced in my past. This trouble is conspicuous to every other kind of trouble I've ever gone through. In other words, I've had trouble all my life, but this trouble showed up. And when this trouble showed up in my life, it threw me beyond a usual mark. It was unlike other trouble. This is not normal trouble. And that's what the Apostle Paul is saying. This trouble pushed me to the extent or the full capacity of my faith. In other words, it busted my metron. It threw me beyond my lines. You ever heard terminology like this? I can't take it no more. Or it's too much to handle. I can't go through this another day. Now, some of us in here have faced trouble like that. Some of us have never been there. But if you've ever been through trouble like that, I've come to preach to you and tell you today that you are not by yourself. Are y'all in the build? So he said, it's taking me out of character. And watch what he said. But we had this sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God which raises the dead. So the purpose of trouble is to place your trust in the proper place. Trouble shows up to see where your trust is. So he said, we've discovered in this trouble that we can't trust in ourselves. And when the sentence of death is already living in us, we know that we do not have the capability nor the ability to make it through the trouble we're in. So we have to throw our trust on somebody else. So we chose to take this trouble and throw it on God because God is able to raise the dead. Meaning, if the trouble kills me, God will raise me back up. It don't matter how much trouble is on you, the worst thing it can do is kill you. And if it kills you, God's going to raise you from the dead. That's how committed he is to you trusting him. I just need to know if there's anybody in the building that's going to trust God regardless of the trouble that you're going on, going on in your life. Come on, high five somebody and tell them faith check, baby. It's a trust check. Where is your trust? He said that we would not trust in ourselves, but we would trust in God who raises the dead. I'm about done. Now let me help y'all with trouble. God got a history with trouble. Trouble ain't never surprised. God. God ain't never looked at trouble and said, you have jeopardized my son or my daughter. No. God is never surprised when trouble shows up in your life. God does not look back, put his hand over his mouth and go, oh my goodness, I hope they're going to make it. I'm so surprised this trouble showed up in their life. No. God knows trouble is coming your way and many times God will remove his hand and let trouble into your life so you will put trust back in him and not in yourself. He won't let trouble take you out, but he will surely let trouble humble you to put your trust back in him. The purpose of trouble is for you to put your trust in the right place. Now, God's history with trouble, he's been working with trouble for a long time. He's been working with trouble for a long time. He's never let trouble show up in anybody's life that is in love with him and he's in love with them that he did not deliver them from the trouble they are going through. That's why Paul writes in verse number 10, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, and I'm about done, that God delivers us from so great a death. He, do, he does deliver in whom we trust. He will yet deliver. He just basically said three tenses. Three tenses. In my past, he delivered me. In my present, he is delivering me. In my future, he will deliver me again. I wouldn't think he could deliver me tomorrow if he didn't deliver me yesterday. But he's brought me through too many things for me not to trust that he's going to bring me through every other thing. I almost died, but God delivered me. I almost lost my mind, but God delivered me. I... 
if he brought me through all of that, then what makes you think he's not going to bring me through every trouble that is in my future? He has delivered. He does deliver. He will yet deliver. So the writer of Proverbs 12, verse 11 says, He that tills his land will be satisfied with bread. He that follows vanity is void of understanding. The wicked desires the net of evil, but the root of the righteous yields fruit. Listen to verse 13. The wicked is snared by the transgression of his mouth, but the just shall come out of trouble. The Amplified Version reads like this. The wicked is dangerously snared by the transgression of his lips, but the uncompromisingly righteous shall come out of trouble. It does not say the righteous shall not have trouble. It says the righteous shall come out of trouble. The difference in people coming out of trouble is your relationship and position in God. Do you know who you are in God and do you know who God is in you? If you know both of those things, then what makes you think trouble's going to kill you? If there's anybody in this building ready to come out of some trouble, I double dog dare you to give God about a 10 second praise like you ready to come out of trouble. I know we participate in a day and we're talking to each other, but I need you to f tell four people, watch me come out. Watch me come out. In other words, don't judge me while I'm on my knees praying about this trouble. Don't judge me while I'm crying about the trouble I'm going through. Don't pass judgment on me while I'm weeping about all the hell breaking loose in my life. Don't judge me too early because I'm broken right now concerning the circumstance I'm in. Don't fool yourself. I always come out. So before you think I'm going to die, you need to sit down and think about it. I done come out too many times to let this trouble kill me. If you're ready to come out, throw your hands up and shout, I'm coming out, I'm coming out, I'm coming out with my hands up. Tell your neighbor I'm coming out with my hands up. I'm tired of seeing people accept trouble like trouble going to kill you. Act like trouble going to just determine your destiny. Like trouble going to defeat you. Trouble ain't going to defeat you. Trouble didn't do nothing but show up for you to put your trust in the living God. So go ahead and throw your hands up and say, welcome, trouble. Thank you for showing up because you reminded me who my source is. You reminded me who my God is. You reminded me who my Savior is. You reminded me who my Lord is. Thank you, trouble, for visiting me. You are welcome to visit, but you are now welcome to stay. Now do your job and get on out of my house. The just shall come out, come out, come out. As a matter of fact, let's declare that over each other. You know what, and here's what we say. When we say these words, we're telling the people we're about to talk to, get out of that trouble. Now jump up, tell three people, get out, get out, get out. You don't have to live there. You don't have to live in that trouble. Come out that trouble. Now, here's the thing. Let me say this to you. Historically, and I'm done. Thank you, Hector. Historically and chronologically, every time God's people went into trouble, and there's a pattern with them, and it's a pattern with us, because it's life, and life happens. Life happens. It happens, all right? And so because life happens, we get in this routine of getting in trouble, getting out of trouble. Tell the truth, shame the devil, admit it. If the apostle can't admit it, you can't admit it. 
I can't stand people that act like they ain't got no trouble. Ain't never been through trouble in their life. Every time you see them, they put on this whole praise the Lord thing. Right. Oh, praise the Lord. <laughs> praise the Lord, brother. Brother, I've been knowing you 15 years. I ain't never seen you one time tell me, Bishop, can you pray for me? And you know you're hurting on the inside. About to lose your natural mind. You're going to lose your mind you keep faking like that because you can only play so long. Sometimes you got to break it down and say, man, oh, hell, breaking loose in my life, brother. Please help me. I'm talking better to you than you talking to me. That's the truth. But here's the powerful thing, John. Historically, follow it through Scripture. People of God go into trouble, come out of trouble. Every time they come out, they come out with stuff. Hold on now. Not bad stuff. Always good stuff. Genesis 15, sun going down. Verse 12, deep sleep falls on Abram. The horror of great darkness fell on him. Now that sounds like an atmosphere of trouble. And God said to Abram, Know for sure that your seed shall be a stranger in a land that is not theirs. Now, he's, God's telling this. This is what in your future. Guess what's in your future? Trouble. <laughs> and they shall afflict my people for 400 years. And also that nation whom they serve, I'm going to judge that nation. And then afterward, my people will come out with great substance. You might have your way for a minute, but my people coming out. And when they come out, they're going to come out with more than they had before they went into trouble. Somebody shout real loud, I'm coming out with my hands up and my pockets full. My God today. So guess what happens? Exodus chapter 5, people are in bondage. The Lord said to Moses, now go and do what I told you to do. Tell Pharaoh, for with a strong hand, he's going to let my people go. And with a strong hand, he's going to drive my people out. Skip down to verse 6. Wherefore, say to the children of Israel, I am your Lord. I will bring you out from under your trouble. And I will rid you of their bondage. And I will redeem you with a stretched out arm. And I will take you to me for a people, and I will be for you a God. Go over to Exodus chapter 12. When you look at verse number 32, it says, Your flocks, your herds, as you have said. Look, watch, what, watch what he says. Let me back up verse 31. Exodus 12, 31. He called for Moses and Aaron by night, this Pharaoh, and said, Rise up and get forth from my people. Get out of here, both you and the children of Israel, and go serve your Lord. Take your flocks, take your herds, as you have said, and be gone. <laughs> Guess what happens? When trouble come in your life, if you're really serving God, you start troubling trouble. In other words, trouble like, uh-uh, no, just leave. Just take whatever you want, but get out. Are y'all here? And watch what, it, watch what the Bible says. Verse 33, and the Egyptians were urgent on the people of God that they may send them out of the land in haste. For they said, we dying while y'all here. Skip all the way down. Verse 41, it came to pass at the end of the 430 years, self same day, what God said in Genesis happened in Exodus, that it came to pass that all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Say it again, I'm coming out. Now, I want you to listen to me just for a moment. Give me five minutes, and I'm done with this message. The two words come out means come into public view, to make a public appearance, or to become evident. In other words, reveal who you really are. Reveal who you really are. Another definition for come out means to end up. In other words, it came out like this. Or it ended up like this. Now, let me encourage you. Talk to you just for a moment. 
Many of you are going through trouble in your life. You've never seen it like this, this kind of trouble. Okay? You're not only going to come out of the trouble, but you're going to end up better than you've ever been. So when you say it came, everything came out all right, you're saying it ended up all right. Well, let me help you. It's not going to end up all right. It's going to end up great. The question is, do you have the tenacity to endure the trouble? Do, the, do you have the fortitude to outlast the trouble? Or are you going to still be standing when trouble leaves your life? To make a debut, a person's first appearance. Here's, here's what stood out to me. A performance in a particular capacity, a role. When I saw that, Yvette, I heard the Lord say to me to tell my people, impress. When I say I heard the Lord say to me, don't come talk in my ear. I just felt impressed in prayer. These words. This is not your first performance. This is the prophetic word for people in this building today. This is not your first performance, but this is your first time in this role. It's not your first rodeo. You just ain't never rode this horse. This is not your first performance, but this is your first time in this role. You've never had to play this character. And when Paul writes to the church at Corinth, he's saying, I'm dealing with something that's taken me into another character. So the question is, can you handle enough trouble till God transforms your character? Because God can make you into a person that can beat the trouble. But you have to allow him to do that. That denotes the idea to me that every time unpredictable trouble shows up in our life, it's God's sign that he's moving us to a level of living we've never lived in before. So you can't be who you were to enjoy something you never had. Are y'all in the building right there? Amen. And some of you do not realize that the agitation and the all of the stuff going on in the atmosphere of your life is God giving you a sign that you're not going down. Do y'all fly often? I fly all the time. I fly all the time. I fly on planes all the time. Many people say, it's that landing that gets me. I get so scared on the, when it's landing. Well, I'm going to be real with y'all. This white boy right here, he, don't, he ain't scared of no landing. He's scared when that thing leaving. <laughs> I've been flying for all my life, especially in the last 35 years. I have flown so many flights, I can't even number them. Every time, Deb, I'm going to be vulnerable with you right now, I do the same thing. <laughs> and it's my prayer, Lord, forgive me of all my sin. <laughs> Wash me and cleanse me of all my iniquity. <laughs> don't act like you don't pray like that when you fly. <laughs> and then I say, now, Lord, keep your son. Keep your son, Lord. Keep your son. You know I'm your boy. <laughs> you call me Ricky, I call you Lord. We like that, Lord. <laughs> and here's what they say. There is on the runway, at the end of the runway, what is called the threshold. And when you're passing through that threshold, everything that can be shaken will be shaken. That's turbulence. And you feel like, oh, Jesus. 
And when it ends, you're just like, oh, Lord, bring me some ginger ale. Because you made it through the threshold. Right? I remember one time I was flying with Tim Johnson. And Tim used to sit by me all the time, which that's a problem in itself. Because he's nervous about everything. You know, What's that noise? What's that noise? I ain't never heard that noise before now. I'm like, man, don't start, please. And we hit the threshold. That thing started shaking. And when it did, the weather was bad. And it just jumped down like that. But when it did, we still had ice in our glasses. Our ice hit the ceiling. No, I prayed in five other kinds of tongues. <laughs> Not quiet either. <laughs> he fell out, bent over, started screaming out, Jesus, oh, like only Tim can, right? <laughs> Sound like Jane Brown. And I'm telling you, I thought, well, this is it, brother. We going, this is it. It's over for me and you. You ain't singing no more, and I ain't preaching no more. <laughs> and when that thing come out, even the pilot come on there and said, sorry about that. <laughs> I'm like, sorry about that. Why you ever leave, brother? <laughs> but when that thing come out there and that thing started sailing smooth, I leaned back. I looked at him and said, why was you so scared, brother? I knew everything was going to be all right. Ain't that how we act when we come out of trouble? We come out of trouble like, man, well, I wasn't worried about that, man. I ain't nothing. Right? And that's how we do. Well, let me help you. Some of you are in the threshold right now, and that turbulence is doing that right there. And you feel like, I don't know how much more I can take. Let me help you. It's a sign that you are going higher than you've ever been in your life. You're about to go to a plane and a place that you've never been in your life. This trouble ain't gonna kill you. This turbulence ain't gonna take you out. Go ahead and smile and pull back on that ginger ale one more time. Tell your neighbor, cause everything gonna be all right. Tell your neighbor, I'm coming out of this. Amen, tell them I'm telling God, the trouble has visited me one too many times. And look down at the ground and say, trouble, I'm telling God on you. I ain't talking to nobody else. I'm talking to God about this because God is going to pull me out. If y'all are ready to come out, jump on your feet and give God a praise like you're really ready to come out. Everything going to end up all right. Praise God. Now, if you're in this building and you say, Bishop, this is my word. I've been through a lot of trouble in my life, but I'm going through some trouble right now that has the potential to take me out. I needed this word today, and I needed to know that God's got my back and that he's going to bring me out of this, and I'm going to be improved, and I'm going to be better on the other side of this trouble. I'm going to be bigger on the other side. If this is your word, would you come to this altar right now and let me pray for you. If this is your word today, as I was preaching, this word hit you. You said, I needed this word, Bishop. I needed this word. Would you come and let me pray for you? Trouble can scare you. Trouble can terrify you. Trouble can send you into trepidation and phobia, a fear you've never experienced before. And if you've got fear in your life right now, concern that everything is not going to turn out all right, you need to be in this altar because I want to pray for you and remind you that the word of the Lord says, the uncompromisingly righteous person shall come out of all his trouble. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. If he brought you out before, he's going to bring you out again. It don't matter how big the trouble is, how bad the trouble is. He's done it before. He will absolutely do it again. So I'm going to ask you to be so kind and dare to pray this prayer with me. Every hand raised all over the building and repeat after me. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me 
unconditionally. And you would not allow anything to show up in my life that I can't handle. So fortify my faith. And I thank you, Lord, that even though it feels like things are falling apart, it's actually all coming together. You're removing stuff from my life that doesn't need to be there. And I accept that today. Help me, Lord, to keep my faith high and this problem low. I give you praise that you care enough about me to bring me through this and out of this. And I thank you that when I come out, I will not be bitter. I will be better in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give God praise, shall we?